morning, if you would open up your Bibles with me to the book of Mark, we are going to begin our series through the book of Mark. We finished last week looking at the last of the fruit of the Holy Spirit, which would be self-control. It's such a joy to look at self-control. And so we finished up in Galatians 5, and I have been very anxious and excited to move to the book of Mark. Mark is the second gospel that we find in the New Testament. Second book we find in the New Testament as well. And obviously, where do we begin? Chapter 1, verse 1 is where we will begin. We will move verse by verse, word for word, phrase by phrase, through this book. We're going to see so much. We're going to see Christ's work, His teaching. We're going to see so much about Christ. <coughs> it's no coincidence that God gave us four Gospels. And He inspired four men to write testimonies to the life and work of Jesus Christ. That's not a coincidence. But it was in the plan of God. It was something He had chosen to do. So, Mark 1, 1 reads these words. Mark writes, The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Let us pray. Father, now as we consider the truth of your word, as I preach your word, I pray for grace, for abundant grace, to make known the mystery of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, in a way which honors you. Lord, I pray for those who hear that they would be saved from their sin. And for those among us who are converted, Lord, that each and every one of us would be encouraged. We would be grown in grace as we behold Christ. He is the, the author and perfecter of our faith. He is the object of our faith. He is our our righteousness, our sanctification, our redemption. He is our all in all. And He is all we will ever need. And so, Lord, I pray that we would be transformed. We thank You for Your Word. We thank You for inspiring Mark to write these very words, to write these 16 chapters, these, these precious truths in Your Word. We thank You for that, Father. We, we ask that You be glorified in this time, in our lives and in all things, and in the preaching of the gospel of your Son. Not to us, not to us, but to your name. Give glory to the Lord. And it is in the name of your Son, the Son of God, we pray these things. Amen. Amen. Considering what ha has happened in the news recently, from Charlottesville to actually what happened just a couple days ago in Barcelona. There's bad news everywhere, all over the place. And not only that, but even in our own homeland with tensions within our own government. North Korea, a possible war that might break out with them on that front. More bad news upon bad news. Or perhaps even in our own lives. Seasons of trial and hardship, or just struggles with sin, bring us into a state of depression. And we find ourselves oftentimes marinating in bad news, meditating about, upon bad news, because it comes at us at every angle. So much darkness. And so little light in this world. Where do we find the light of life that, that nourishes the weary soul? It is all in the gospel message. The truth of the Christian faith. That is where we find sustenance and food for the soul. And as we begin studying through Mark... We see the first thing he highlights is that this book he is writing is the gospel. It is the essence of the good news. It is not only Mark's focus, but it is Matthew's as well. It's Matthew's focus. It's Luke's focus. 
It's John's focus. It is Paul's focus. It is Isaiah's focus. It is Moses' focus. It is Peter's focus. It is the focus of all of Scripture. It all culminates and it all centers around the truth of the Gospel. And it ought to be the focus and the centerpiece, the crown jewel of our lives. It ought to be the cardinal point of who we are. It is everything to us. In fact, John Calvin, the great reformer, said these words about the gospel. It is so fitting. Listen to what he said. He said, without the gospel, everything is useless and vain. Everything. This life we live, this world we find ourselves in, the faith which we practice is all a vain pursuit apart from the gospel. It is all satisfying. It is enough for the believer. That being the gospel. We need not anything else but to know that Jesus Christ has died for sinners like ourselves. That is enough for us. It is enough for the unbeliever to be saved. To believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ. And to be saved. It is the sufficient gospel. And that is what we will see in this sermon. Is the gospel of Jesus Christ. The Son of God. But before we do that. As always, as always in Scripture, when we go to Scripture and we begin to interpret, we must first consider the context. And so with Mark, specifically the entirety of the book of Mark, it is Mark's gospel account. It is a, it is a, it is a chronicling of Jesus' life and ministry, <coughs> event by event, word for word. And it was written quite early in the first century. Well, I would say, uh, in, in relation to the rest of the books of the, Old of the New Testament, it was written about 50 to 60 A.D., sometime within that decade. Much of this book is found within Matthew and Luke. In fact, uh, these, three, these three Gospels are called the Synoptic Gospels. Synoptic means seeing together. Or, excuse me, together seeing. They all are very similar to one another. And a liberal and secular scholars have tried to answer why these three Gospels are so similar. They have contemplated the possibility of what is called the Q document, that being a, an extra Gospel that is lost, and that all three drew their material from. Some have also uh, speculated that Matthew and Luke used Mark as a source when they wrote their Gospels. But Matthew is an eyewitness. He didn't need Mark as a Gospel source. The simple answer, the biblical answer, is that they all had the same God who inspired them. The reason they're so similar is because they all testify to the same truth. The reason they're so similar is because the same Holy Spirit who enabled Matthew to write is the same Holy Spirit who enabled Mark to write, and the same Holy Spirit who enabled Luke to write. That's why they're similar. It's really quite simple. But particularly, who is Mark? In fact, his name is John Mark. They don't want to have two Johns. Gospel John 1, Gospel John 2. It just doesn't flow well. But his name was John Mark. He was a close companion of Peter, in fact. He was very close to Peter. Peter called Mark this. In 1 Peter 5.13, he said, My son, Mark. He called him his son, not being obviously a physical son, but a son of the faith. He was a disciple of Peter. Peter taught him things concerning the Christian faith. In fact, uh, many believe in, in considering church history and, and tradition that Mark used much of his material and drew much of it from Peter himself. Peter was really the source of Mark's writing. Because Peter was an eyewitness. Peter was very close, very intimate with the Lord Jesus, and so Mark uses Peter and writes his gospel from Peter's perspective. Many also believe that Mark was writing to the church of Rome. Church tradition tells us that. And I would, I would definitely agree with that because the book of Mark is written from a very um, Gentile perspective. Oftentimes when there's Aramaic terms used, 
he translates them in his writing. He translates them for the Gentile audience so they would understand. Moreover, Mark, John Mark, ministered with Paul and Barnabas. He wasn't just close to Peter, but he was also a minister companion or a fellow missionary with Paul and Barnabas. He was actually Barnabas' cousin. That makes a connection. He accompanied Paul and Barnabas on their first missionary journey in the book of Acts. However, as we know, uh, Mark actually abandoned Paul and Barnabas on their first missionary journey. And it seems to indicate, Acts does, that Paul did not like John, or at least he was upset with him for abandoning them. And so that was actually why Paul and Barnabas split. They wanted to go to different places, and Barnabas wanted to take Mark with him. And Paul did not. But later on, Paul spoke of Mark in a very high fashion. So it seems to be that Mark perhaps fell into sin, but God restored him. And so Paul could later on write of him in a very good fashion. Mark is also known for fast-paced writing. Very fast. He uses the word immediately a lot in this book. It's a con you could say it's the concise gospel. It's the, it's the shortened version. That's why it's not fitting for us to go through. 16 chapters. It may take time, but it certainly would not take as long as Matthew, which would, is 28 chapters. Or John, or even Luke is 24, John's 21. It moves quickly, scene to scene, focuses more on what Jesus did than what Jesus said. Whereas like the book of John is mostly Jesus' discourses and sermons. But Mark is more about Jesus' actions and his healing. In fact, if you have a red letter Bible, as you flip through Mark, you're going to see a, a significantly smaller amount of the words in red and more of the dark uh, black print. More of what Jesus was doing. In fact, as I said a moment ago, in terms of that word immediately, Mark loved this word. In uh, chapter 1, he used it 10 times. 10 times, chapter 1. And in the whole book, he used it 39 times. We are going to fall in love with the word immediately because John loved it. Another main focus of Mark is Jesus' humility. And Jesus is humanity. He presents Jesus as the incarnate Son of God. John's focus was the divinity of Christ. That was a big focus of the book of John. We see over and over the seven sayings of our Lord Jesus, the seven I am sayings, declaring himself to be the almighty God. But Mark is more about Jesus' his humanity. The aspect of our Lord that he was God in human flesh. That he got hungry. He slept. He cried. He hurt. He experienced the things which we experience as human beings, for he was fully, completely, truly human. However, Jesus' humanity never negates the reality that he is Almighty God in flesh. And that's indicated by this first verse. Because he says it is the gospel of Jesus Christ. He doesn't say that God made flesh. He doesn't say the Son of God made flesh. He just says the Son of God, the divine. Son of God, which is what we will consider this morning, the gospel of the Son of God. He says there, verse 1, the beginning, the gospel of Jesus Christ. The word there in Greek is euangelion. Euangelion means good tidings. In fact, the Greeks used the word euangelion in wartime whenever they won a battle. It was used... As a victory cry, Evangelion, good tidings, we won. <coughs> and uh, we can praise God today that Christ has victoriously defeated death. And he has, he has won the victory. He has purchased eternal salvation for his people by dying for them. That's the good news of the gospel. Obviously, as we go through Mark, we're going to see it's all about Christ. It's not about us. It's not even about our good. It's about the work and person of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the essence of the gospel. But, dear friends, both unconverted and converted, you must understand this. Before we contemplate what is the good news... What is the good tidings of the gospel? We must understand the bad news. 
We must grasp the fact that God is a holy God. We have fallen short of His glory. And we are condemned to hell without hope. Any good doctor takes time and explains to his patients the diseases and the ailments which they have, and then he gives them the cure. He gives them the treatment options. He takes his time to tell them the bad news before he can give them the good. So any preacher of the gospel, and any time we contemplate the gospel, let us take time and consider the bad news before the good news. And the first aspect of the bad news I would like for us to consider, and it may puzzle you, is in Mark, is in the book of Mark, in Mark chapter 10. And so if you would, turn with me to Mark 10 as we contemplate the first aspect of the bad news for us. Mark 10, and we're going to start in verse 17 of Mark 10. Many of you perhaps might be familiar with this passage. It's the, it's the account of the rich young ruler coming to our Lord Jesus. It's one of the most interesting evangelistic account encounters Jesus ever had. And sometimes believers find this to be confusing. But it's really not. It's very straightforward, very clear what Jesus says here. Verse 17. It says, As he, that would be our Lord, as he was setting out on a journey, a man ran up to him and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? So this man's asking. He's a seeker. He's a seeker seeking for eternal life. He wants to know, how am I going to go to heaven? How can I? And Jesus' reply is very candid. And he actually does not address that, that, that question in the beginning. In verse 18, he addresses the first thing the young man says. Verse 18, it says, And Jesus said to him, Why? Do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. Now I just want to say this. To address the first thing our Lord says there. Jehovah's Witnesses and other cult groups will interpret this passage to say, Look, Jesus is saying I'm not God. That's a misinterpretation of the passage. What Jesus is doing here is he's asking that man to stop in his tracks and consider and contemplate the one to whom he's talking. He's saying, young man, you need to stop where you are and consider who you're talking to. He doesn't deny that he's good. He just says, why do you call me good? In other words, he's saying, why do you consider me good? No one is good except God alone. So he's saying, in effect, young man, if you say I'm good, what you're saying to me, what you're addressing to me is I am the Almighty. I am God in flesh. In fact, Jesus is affirming what he said. He's just challenging that young man to consider the weightiness, the weightiness of who he is. And that is the most terrifying truth in all the Bible. It is the most terrifying truth in all Scripture. This truth right here in verse 18 no one is good except God alone. That is absolutely terrifying. That God is good. Perverse sinners will say that day after day. Even ungodly people in churches will sing that hymn and think. And think that that is something they ought to smile about. And it is. It's glorious that God is good. But do they tremble at that? At that reality? Do you tremble at this reality? That God is good? His moral character is without flaw? That He is absolutely perfect? Even Christian, even you brethren, consider this for a moment. Scripture exhorts us to, to serve and, and worship God in fear and trembling. How do we do that? We consider that God is perfect. We see this all throughout the Old Testament. It is everywhere in the Old Testament and the New Testament. What happened in Acts 5 when Ananias and Sapphira lied to the Holy Spirit? What did God do? He struck them down immediately. Immediately. What was that? That was God displaying His holiness. He does not tolerate sin. In the Old Testament, 2 Samuel, 
Uh, David is desiring to move the ark of God into Jerusalem. So he, he, he gets a couple of men with himself and they go and they get the ark. And these men are moving the ark of the covenant. One of the men uh, that was in their midst, his name was Uzzah. Uzzah, imagine that was your name. Uzzah was with these men who were moving the ark of God. They're moving into Jerusalem. And as it's being it's pulled on this cart because it was so heavy, it was gold. It was a box of gold. It was so heavy. And so they were pulling it behind this cart. And it says that the cart had become unsteady. And it was probably that it had hit a bump or something and it was going to fall. Or perhaps it seemed as if it was going to fall off the cart. And so Uzzah reaches out to stop the ark from falling. And it says that the Lord's anger burned against Uzzah and struck him down dead when he touched the ark. That is how good God is. That is how holy God is. That is how perfect God is. Another example, Leviticus, Leviticus 9. God instituted the Aaronic priesthood where Aaron and his sons were to serve God and offer up sacrifices in the temple. And in, in Leviticus 9, Aaron offers up a sacrifice at the end of Leviticus 9 and God receives it. It actually says, fire came down from heaven and received the sacrifice and burned it up on the altar. But then the next chapter, just a few verses later, his two sons... A part of the Aaronic priesthood went in and it says they offered up strange fire to the Lord. In other words, they did not do it the way God said to do it. They did not worship Him the way God said to worship Him. And so what happened? Immediately fire came down from heaven and engulfed them both alive. Alive. That is how good God is. Another example, Isaiah 6. The prophet Isaiah gets a vision of glory. A vision of heaven. He is allowed to see God. One of the few people who have ever seen God. You know, it's so crazy when you read these books about people who say they've been to heaven. And you know what you never see is them talking about that they were terrified. Never. They were never terrified. They didn't go to heaven because they weren't terrified. Listen to Isaiah. One of the most holy men Whoever walked the earth. Isaiah 6 1. In the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted, with the train of his robe filling the temple. Seraphim stood above him, each having six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called out to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the thresholds trembled at the voice of him who called out, and the temple was filling with smoke. Could you imagine seeing that? If these angels standing in God's presence are covering themselves, and then it's as if they're grabbing at straws or just trying to, to, to put it into words what they're seeing, and so they cannot find words that will adequately express who God is, and so they just say, Holy, holy, holy. Is the Lord of hosts. And then listen to verse 5. It's Isaiah writing, first person. He says, Then I said, Woe is me, for I am ruined, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell among a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. And you think you can stand before God? You think you'll stand before God in yourself? You're self-deceived. If you think your goodness is sufficient for you to stand before God, if you think you can stand before God in your own goodness, you are self-deluded. Because the most holy man, Isaiah, stood before God in his day and saw the Lord and he said, woe is me. He's saying, I'm damned. I'm lost. He's saying, I'm going to be lost. He's disgusted with himself. He is self-loathing. You want to know if someone's holy? Brethren, you want to know, you want to gauge your own holiness? How much do you loathe yourself? How much do you loathe yourself? That's a gauge of holiness. Jesus is not a self-love guru. He's a self-hate guru. In fact, I spoke with a man in Greenville on Friday. He said he had become a believer recently. I was so encouraged about this young man. God is clearly doing a work in his life. But he said one thing that I had to correct. And I'm sure it's a lot of false theology he's being 
being hearing from other people. He said, I'm just having a hard time learning to love myself. I said, oh, no problem. Jesus is a self-hate guru, not a self-love guru. Said, You're in a good place. Christianity is not about self-love. It's about self-detesting. You're disgusted with yourself. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. What's he talking about there? What's our Lord talking about in the Beatitudes? Blessed are those who mourn. Mourn over their sin. Mourn over their filthiness before God. Jesus himself said, whoever loves his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake, he's the one who saved him. That flies in the face of a lot of evangelical preaching. Dare I say evangelical, because it's not evangelical. The character of God, he is different than we. Inherently, men think God to be so different than what he says he is. That's just, that's, just, that's just man's fault. People are automatically idolaters. Automatically, they worship a God who fits their own imagination and their own desires. I see this all the time on the streets. False converts, they have no concept of who God is. On Friday night, I was talking to a couple. And the conversation began cordial and it ended very abruptly as the woman began to blaspheme. Even though she said she was a Christian, she said she wanted to beat me up. I said, it's because you're not a Christian. That's why you want to beat me up. But we had an amazing conversation. And, this, and these two people I talked to, just in a few minutes, they had no concept of God. They had no idea who God is. No idea. What is the promise of the new covenant? They will know me. You want to know if you're genuinely a Christian? You want to know whether you've genuinely been born again? Do you know God according to how He reveals Himself in His Word? That's how, you know you're, that's how you know you're saved is when you know God the way He's revealed Himself to be. It is so true that God is gracious and compassionate. It is so true. He is the personification of love. He is love, but that is never to the negation of His holiness. That's what people don't get. It's amazing. You just run into people all the time. But God's love, God's mercy, God's gracious. How often do you hear, man, praise the Lord that He damns sinners to hell. You ever hear that? You know, the Psalms are filled with that. Did you know that? The Psalms are filled with people praising the Lord for judging the wicked. What do we, what do we say? Maranatha, come Lord Jesus. You know what we're saying? We're saying, come and get us and punish the wicked. God is just. He's a holy God. How often do your Christians say, as I was considering God's holiness, I was trembling and I was terrified of the Lord. How often do you hear that? You don't. You don't hear it. But we need to do that, brethren. We need to be so enraptured by His love. We do. We do. But let us... His, His holiness is beautiful. It's beautiful. In fact, that's what makes Him so beautiful. Think about a love that's unholy. Think about a love that's just as generic and it's not, a, it's not a holy love. Think about that. That's disgusting. What a, what a, what a pseudo-love that is. Praise God that His love is in accordance to His holiness. And His holiness is in accordance to His love. The wicked will be punished on the day of wrath. Because God is just. God is like a just judge here in Lawrence County who punishes evildoers. And He has the right to. He has the right. I want us to consider the second thing when we talk about the bad news. And some of these things I say are good. They are all good. But in relation to us, it's bad news for us. God's holiness is so good and so great. It brings joy to my heart to know God is just. But in relation to the sinner, that is terrifying bad news. Because they are not. Let's consider the second thing. And that is the law of God. The law of God. Listen, as we go back to Mark 10. We're still walking through Mark 10. So if you, if you were there, perhaps you had it, your thumb was holding that spot. Flip back there to Mark chapter 10, verse 19. So the next verse. We're going verse by verse into this in this section here. Listen to what Jesus says. So right after, in verse 18, he says, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. So we understand what he's saying there. And then in verse 19, listen to what he says. You know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. 
Honor your father and mother. Do you know what Jesus is doing there? The master evangelist, the chief evangelist is doing this. He is showing the goodness of God. He's saying, okay, God is good. Here's how he's good. He is not a murderer. He is not unfaithful. All these commands reflect to us the character of God. They, re they reflect to us who God is. The law is a mirror, my friends. And it reflects to us the glory of God. The weightiness of God's character, that He is perfect. That's what the commands of the law are. God says you shall not lie because He's not a liar. God says you shall not steal because He's not a thief. God says you shall not murder because He's not a murderer. God says you shall not commit adultery because He's a faithful, covenant-keeping God. These all show us something about God. They're just not little moralistic commands. God just wrote to make society better. It's the holy law of God. What did Jesus say in Matthew 5? He said, not one jot or tittle will ever pass from the law until all is fulfilled. What did the psalmist say? Psalm 19. Excuse me, it's Psalm 19, verse 7. The law of the Lord is perfect, restoring the soul. God's law is perfect. And if you're a sinner, if you're outside of Christ, the law condemns you. The law condemns you. Because not only does it show us God's character, not only does it show us God's perfection and God's inherent <coughs> holiness, but it shows the sinner his state before God. Some mornings I wake up and I've had a good night's rest. I've had a good sleep. It was not rough. I was like a baby. I slept like a baby. I wake up and I feel great. I can't wait to take on the day. And I go in the bathroom and look into the mirror and I see that I need a shower. I need to wash my face. I need to trim my beard. I need to brush my hair. I thought I looked good. I felt good. And I looked at myself and realized I need to clean up. I was a mess. And that is a small idea of what the law is. Sinners inherently think themselves to be good. People are inherently proud. People are inherently self-righteous. People are inherently haters of God. And so what the law is, is a mirror showing them their filth. And showing that to the core of their being, they hate God. Just going back to some uh, a conversation I had on, on, on Friday night. But that same couple I referenced earlier, I was talking to. Do you know they told me, they said, listen... You don't have to tell people they've sinned. You don't have to show people the law. Just talk about grace, 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 grace all the time. You don't have to tell them the bad news. They said, people know already. I said, no, they don't. People have no idea what they've done. They have no idea. I know Scripture says they have consciences and they know they've sinned against God. But they don't know how weighty that is. They don't know how weighty their sin is before God. And we don't know, brethren, how great our sin is. In fact, as a Christian, you know what we're always doing? We're always seeing our sin and seeing our filth and seeing our iniquity so that God's grace is more beautiful. You can only appreciate God's grace as much as you understand the weight of your sin. They are, at, they are inexorably tied to one another. You cannot pull them apart. The less you understand your sin, the less you understand how bad you are, the less you'll see how great God's grace is. That's why sinners, that's why sinners don't come to Christ. They don't think they need Christ. They think they're okay. And so what does the law do? It says, no, you are not. You're a liar, you're a thief, a blasphemer, a fornicator, an idolater. You hate God, as Romans 1.30 says, and you have a depraved mind. Total depravity. Absolute inability. You cannot come to Christ. You cannot do anything that pleases God because you will not do anything that pleases God. Jesus said no one can come to me. Why? Because they will not come to Him. Why was no one killed? Because people hate God. And listen to what Jesus was also doing, something else in this text here. He was calling to that man's attention the law of God to show him firstly the character of God and to show him his character in light of God's character. And that's why it says in verse 20, And he said to him, Teacher, I have kept all these things from my youth up. Did he really? 
Did he really keep those things? Maybe he had an outward conformity, an outward righteousness, as Paul talks about he had in Philippians 3. But inwardly, what is he? He's dead in sin. He's broken his commands. So he, he gives false testimony to Jesus. He lies to Jesus. And then listen to what verse 21 says. Looking at him, Jesus felt a love for him and said to him, One thing you lack. Go and sell all your possessions and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. Verse 22. But at these words he was saddened, and he went away grieving, for he was one who owned much property. What's Jesus saying? So we've got to become social justice warriors and give up all of our money, and we're going to enter to heaven? So true Christians have to give up all the money. Is that what Jesus is saying? What Jesus is showing that man is he is not good enough. Because here's the thing. Let's say he did go and sell all his possessions. And he came back to Jesus. He said, Jesus, I kept this one. Jesus, Jesus would have said, all right, take off your turban and go and give it to someone. He'd come back and say, Jesus, I did it. He'd say, okay, take off your coat and give it to someone. Jesus is showing him that no matter how much he does, it's not good enough. It's just not sufficient. Uh, the, the reformer Martin Luther, he was, a, he was a Catholic monk for years before he became a genuine Christian. And you know what he spent those years doing in that monastery in Germany? Trying to be good enough. He said he was terrified day after day because he knew God was holy and he was a sinner. And he would, he would, they would spend all night prayer vigils. They would stay up all night and try to pray. He would even pray out in the snow <coughs> with no clothes on in the snow to try to further make it difficult for himself so he could show God his dedication. They would eat bread and they would eat stale bread and drink water. He would torture himself with these other monks trying to obtain righteousness. And you know what he found after all those years? It wasn't good enough. In fact, he said in his own testimony, he says, I began to hate God. We well, always hated God, but it just became more so. The law is not meant to save you. The law is not meant to save you, O oh sinner. It's meant to show you that you cannot be good enough. The Bible is not a self-help program. And the law of God is not a self-help program. It is not a means of salvation. It is, the, it is the schoolmaster, as Galatians 3 tells us, which leads us to Christ. The schoolmaster teaches the school a students things. And the law is a schoolmaster. And it says, you are not good enough. And so that brings us to the third thing I'd like to make note of. And that is man's helpless state. Because of our breaking of the law and our trampling of these commands underfoot, we are condemned, we are consigned, and we are set to that place of eternal torment. Jesus spoke so often about. In fact, uh, going back to that couple, uh, I, I have referenced a couple of times here, and I spoke with them on Friday night. I told them, I said, which one did Jesus speak more about? Heaven or hell? He spoke about hell more. Why? Because he wanted to warn sinners, don't go to hell. You don't have to perish in your sins. That's why I spoke more. And they were so belligerent, they said, no, 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 no. He spoke more on heaven. That's just, just a fact. He spoke more on hell. He wanted to warn sinners of the ensuing wrath. But one chapter back, if you turn to Mark 9, I'm trying to keep this grounded in the book of Mark here. Mark 9, verse 43. Listen to what Jesus says. He says, verse 43, If your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off, for it is better for you to enter life crippled than having to your two hands to go into hell, into the unquenchable fire. Unquenchable fire. A flame that cannot be quenched. Verse 44, Where the worm does not die, and the fire is not quenched. Verse 45. If your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. For it is better for you to enter life lame than having two feet to be cast into hell. Where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. If your eye causes you to stumble, throw it out. For it is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hell. Where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. 
God's wrath is coming. And it is coming to consume the adversaries. This is where we are consigned. And Jesus says hell is so bad, you, you ought to cut off limbs if they cause you to sin and they bring you there because you better, you'd rather enter into heaven with losing limbs than go to hell with your whole body. You'd rather mutilate a, 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 an appendage of your body than go into hell. A scary place. A scary place. Let the moans of the dance make you fear the Lord. If you won't fear God for anything else, let the moans of the damned make you fear the Lord. For Jesus said it is a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. He called it the place of outer darkness. You ever been somewhere so dark? I've been in a cave before where you hold out your hand in front of your face, you cannot see. You cannot see even your own hand. And hell, that is a bright day compared to the darkness of hell. Sinners often mock, mock, they often mock the gospel and say, oh, we'll have fun in hell. We'll party in hell. They'll think it's so cool. On the day of torment and the day of judgment, there will not be jesting and joking. There is only wrath. You will be singled out. The sinner, if you're outside of Christ on the day of judgment, you're going to be singled out and God's going to deal with you. It's easy to run into the pack. It's easy to run out with the world because most people are walking in an ungodly way. And so it's easy to run in the group. It's easy to stay in the group. But on the day of judgment, God's going to single you out and you're going to be dealt with individually. Brethren, sinners are going to be dealt with individually. Let that break our hearts. Break our hearts for them. If they won't weep for their souls, let us weep for them. And let not one of them go to hell without having first stepping over the sea of our tears that are shed on their behalf. And we are without hope. There's no good. Because we're going to find ourselves in an in infinite regress as this young ruler was with Jesus. He was not willing to see his sin. He was not willing to see that he could not enter into God's kingdom. And that's why, listen to what Jesus says in verse 23. Going back to Mark 10. Listen to what it says in verse 23. And Jesus, looking around, said to his disciples. This is one of the few times when Jesus says something out of wonder and amazement. Jesus sees this man, and he's in wonder. In his humanity, in our Lord's humanity, not that he learned something new, he's Almighty God, but in his humanity, he's, he's in wonder. He's astounded. Listen to what he says. How hard it is for those who are wealthy to enter the kingdom of God. Verse 24, the disciples were amazed at his words, but Jesus answering again and said to them, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. Notice he expands it. So first he says, if your rich is hard, but then he says, it's hard. Anybody to enter God's kingdom. And in the Jews, in their culture, in their day, it was considered and thought among the Jews that if you were wealthy, you were, it was much easier to get to God's kingdom. In fact, the wealthy were the most likely to go to heaven. And the poor were not. So Jesus says, the wealthy, how hard it is for them go into God's kingdom. That would be like Jesus in our day. Perhaps something to the like of how hard it is for deacons to enter the kingdom of God. Or how hard it is for pastors to enter the kingdom of God. That would be somewhat of an equivalent. If Jesus said the same thing today, we'd be astounded. We'd say, pastors, deacons, spiritual men, they can't enter? The, per the, the layman can never make it. And, this, this, and the disciples in, in reaction and we'll see that in a moment, but verse 25, Jesus says, It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. They were even more astonished and said to him, Then who can be saved? I love this, verse 27. So now that the disciples are astonished, and they are, after they're depressed, you can imagine how depressed they were. Verse 27, looking at them, Jesus said with P 
people, it is impossible, but not with God. For all things are possible with God. And that brings comfort to the weary soul. Because salvation is impossible. It is absolutely impossible. But with God, all things are possible. And so that leads us to consider the gospel. As Mark writes in chapter 1, verse 1, the good news. This is the good news. As Mark puts it. Going back to Mark 9, verse 30. It says these words. For they went out and began to go throughout Galilee. And he did not want anyone to know about it. For he was teaching his disciples and telling them. The Son of Man is to be delivered into the hands of men. And they will kill him. And when he has been killed, he will rise three days later. That is the heart of the gospel. That's the good news. God Almighty becomes a man. And he dwells among men. As Matthew 5, 17 tells us, he came to fulfill the law. And he came to please the Father in his perfect life of absolute obedience to the law of God. Turn with me back to Mark 1. Where we found the verse that we considered at the beginning. Mark chapter 1. Listen to verse 10. Mark 1, 10. It says immediately. There's that word we're going to see over and over and over again. Immediately coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens opening and the Spirit like a dove descending upon him. And a voice came out of the heavens. You are my beloved Son, and you I am well pleased. Who can God say that concerning? But Jesus the Lord, no man on earth can God say, I'm pleased in you. No woman on earth can God say, I'm pleased in you. I'm pleased in your performance. Your obedience is sufficient. You're, you've loved me perfectly. You've loved your neighbor perfectly. But Christ, this is toward the end of Jesus' life. At the beginning of his ministry, he had already lived about 30 years. But what's he doing in these years that are hardly recorded in the New Testament? What are these 30 years? What is he doing? He's just living in a quiet town in Israel. What's he doing these 30 years? He's fulfilling the law we broke. He is keeping those commands. Consider this. Both you unconverted and converted, consider this reality. God says you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Who, for the slightest moment, for a split second in their life, can say yes, yes. I love the Lord my God with all my heart, with all my mind, with all my soul, with all my strength. And I love my neighbor as myself. For a split second. Who? Who? The question will be asked, but it will never be answered by any single person. But Jesus Christ. The weightiness of His pleasing the Father is incredible. He fulfills. Think about this. Every moment of every day, Jesus loved the Lord as God with all his heart, mind, soul, and strength. And he loved his neighbor as himself absolutely perfectly. And he never deviated from that. He never left that. He was in perfect obedience to that command every day of his life. And therefore, God could say in an audible voice from heaven, which is so rare in Scripture that this happens, God speaks audibly from heaven. He says, you are my beloved son in whom I am well placed. And then we speak of his, the climax of his ministry. As he preaches and he teaches, as he heals and he raises the dead, he then goes to the cross of Calvary and he is beat and he is whipped. He is betrayed in the hands of sinners. And he is nailed to a cross. The cross of Calvary. But before we consider that, I want us to consider the night before Jesus goes to the cross in the, gar in the garden. He's praying to the Father. And this is in Mark 14, Mark 14, 34. This speaks to what the nature of Jesus' death on the cross was. Verse 34, and he said to them, my soul, speaking to his disciples, my soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and keep watch. And he went a little beyond them and fell to the ground and began to pray that if it were possible, the hour might pass by him. And he was saying, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me. Yet not what I will, but you will. 
Disciples, followers of Christ throughout the ages, have suffered horrible deaths. Cruci Peter, according to church tradition, was crucified upside down. That'd be worse than crucified than standing up. And yet they went to their crucifixions and their torture. Many of them were burned at the stake, drowned alive, boiled in, in hot oil alive for their testimony. And they went to their deaths singing hymns and rejoicing with smiles on their faces. John, Not uh, John Rogers, first martyr under Bloody Mary in England, burned to the stake as his, not, as his wife and nine children watch. Nine of his ten children watch. And they go, and on the way to him being burned alive, it says it was like he was going to a marriage feast. There was joy, it's happy, it's shouting, <coughs> hymn singing. How can that be that Jesus' disciples handled their deaths more better than he did? That is because Jesus underwent something that the physical eye did not see. See, people, preachers oftentimes speak of Jesus taking God's wrath as, as the nails on that cross, as him being beat on his back with the stripes, as him being um, ridiculed and mocked. And they say, yeah, that's the God's wrath falling on him. And that's true. But you want to consider the weightiness of the spiritual aspect of what Christ suffered. See, on that cross, something was happening we cannot see. And that is that the God of glory cut off his breath. He was separated from the goodness of God. What does he cry on the cross? Eloi, Eloi, Lama Shabbatani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus didn't say, These nails, they hurt. My back hurts. I'm thirsting. Which he did say later on, but it wasn't out of pain. It was to fulfill something. But nonetheless, he says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? His sufferings are so much more than physical sufferings. He's taking upon Himself the eternal wrath of God, the, the full weightiness of God's separation. Hell is the enemy being cut off from God's grace. We bask and we bathe in God's grace. Every breath is a gift of mercy. But on the cross, Christ is cut off from that. And as Isaiah 53 tells us, it was His soul being in anguish. It was His soul being in anguish sins of His people, the elect bride of Christ, and God unleashing the full fury of His hatred against sin. Infinite wrath. Hell goes on forever because God is an infinite God. And when you offend an infinite God, you deserve an infinite punishment. But the cross is right. The infinite, uh, the infinite payment being paid. Let us not belittle our Lord's sufferings by limiting it to a physical aspect. And that's why he cries out. He falls, listen, in verse 35, it says he went beyond them and he fell to the ground. He's, he's, he's in agony. He falls on the ground and he's crying out. Let the cop pass in his humanity. And we know from the book of Luke, he began to sweat drops of blood. He was in so much agony and stress. And so he's convicted before the Sanhedrin. And he is crucified. Mark 15, verse 34. At the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama shabachthani. Which is translated, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And then, three verses later, in verse 37, one of the most precious verses in all Scripture, well, the next two verses, I should say, it says, And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. The wrath of God satisfied. The judgment is gone. God's people are freed. Listen to verse 38, though. This, in my opinion, is probably the most important verse in all of Mark. The entire Gospel of Mark. Verse 38. It's not found in Luke and it's not found in Matthew. And it is so crucial. It says, And the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And the, 
in the temple, there was an inner room called the Holy of Holies. And it was only entered in once a year by the high priest on the Day of Atonement on Yom Kippur. And he would make atonement for all the people of Israel so their sins could be forgiven. And he would enter in behind this veil, which was four to six inches thick. That's a, that's a very thick curtain. So no light could enter in. It's this dark room. And he goes in there and the Ark of the Covenant. And God is said to dwell above the Ark. His presence in that room. And the high priest would go into the room, having washed himself physically, but stayed up the whole night before in prayer and study of the Word of God. And they walk, he walked in, and legend says they tied a rope around his ankles, and they put bell, um, little bells on, the, on his garments, so if God struck him down dead, they could pull him out of the rope, so no one else had to step in there. Because if he so much as sinned, or thought a sinful thought while he was in there, God would strike him down dead. It was terrifying. Terrifying. But when Jesus died on that cross, a four to six inch veil. Could you imagine? It's so thick. And it was huge. Massive. It was ceiling to floor, wall to wall curtain. Ginormous curtain. And it was ripped from top to bottom. Exposing the Holy of Holies to the rest of the temple. God's presence now visible and access direct. That is the weightiness and the significance of Christ's atoning work of the cross. He removes the barrier. He removes the veil. He satisfies the wrath. He's, the Lamb of God has been slain. It's done. It's finished. And as the book of the Hebrews says, He's high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. No other high priest no other sacrifices. It is finished. It's done. He cried out in the book of John to tell us that when he died. It is paid for. One word in Aramaic. One word to tell us that. It's gone. <clears throat> Verse 39. When the centurion who was standing right in front of him, this is a pagan Roman, saw the way he breathed his last, he said, Truly, this man was the Son of God. And he was raised on the third day. He defeated death. And he's alive today. That's the gospel message. Christ has put away God's wrath. So in a sense, it is not that we are no longer to fear the Lord, but we fear Him differently. And if you're in Christ, you fear Him differently. Not a fear of damnation, for we know that as Romans 8 tells us, nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. But it is a reverential fear. And it is a, it is a fear mixed with an adoration and an adulation for the God who would do that. For God so loved the world. That is the love of God. And that is the gospel according <coughs> to Mark. That is what Mark's gospel is. The Son of God has come to remove the barrier and has brought us to God, has become the mediator of the new covenant, the covenant of grace. So what you must do then, O oh, you unconverted souls, the response, the proper response to the gospel is as Mark 1.15 says, our Lord Jesus, the beginning of His ministry, the first thing He preaches, He says, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. That's the proper response. Fleeing from sin and rebellion. Turning from your wicked ways. And turning to the living God. And believing upon the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the proper response to the gospel. And what ensues is forgiveness of all sin. All sin. Christ's atonement on the cross is sufficient. It's enough. All sin. Forgiven. And you'll be credited with living Jesus' life. Which He lived. You'll be credited with having fulfilled all righteousness. As He fulfilled all righteousness. Wrapped in the garments of His perfect righteousness. And God, listen to this. God can look upon the sinner and say, This is my beloved son. This is my beloved daughter. In whom I am well pleased. And we can say, It's nothing of me. It's all of grace. All of grace. All of grace. It's all by God's unmerited favor. It's the gospel of grace. It's the gospel of salvation.
as we come to a close, what is the purpose of all this? What is the end of all this? The glory of the Son of God. It's for His glory. It's all for Him. It's all for His glory. For you who are lost, flee your sin and fall upon the mercy of Christ and find yourself safe in the arm of Jesus. And He'll save you from your sins. Matthew 1 tells us His name is Jesus because He will save His people from their sins. Repent and believe upon Christ. And brethren, rest. Rest. Today's the Lord's day. Let us rest. Rest. Not necessarily a physical rest, but we will find that today. But it's so deeper. So much more than that. Think about that. He's, the work is finished. The temple's gone. The, 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 the curtain is torn. The Son of God has died. Yes, He's been raised. Yes, He's ascended into glory. He sat down. And even that has significance. In the Old Testament, there was no seats inside the entire temple. Every priest had to stand up constantly. What was that signifying? That their work was always having to be done over and over and over. Sacrifices day after day after day. And what does Christ do? As the book of Hebrews tells us, well, He's the high priest forever, but it says, it says something amazing. He sat down at the right hand of God. There's not an ounce left that we have to do. Fall. Fall upon the mercy of Christ. Brethren, do it again today. Rest in Christ today. And find Him to be sufficient. Find Him to be all satisfying in all that we will ever need. And let us proclaim this to a lost and dying world. Indeed, this gospel, the gospel according to Mark, they need this gospel. We've seen in conclusion, this is the gospel of salvation, of grace, and of the glory of God. The glorious gospel of the Son of God, Jesus Christ. As the centurion himself said, surely he is the Son of God. How amazing are these truths. So come, you unbelievers. Come, you false converts. And come, you fellow brethren, and rest once more. This is all for the glory of God. So to God be the glory. To the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, be the glory. Indeed, He is the Son of God. And I'm going to close. I'm going to let the, the Apostle Peter have the last word. Who, as we considered at the beginning, probably gave Mark most of the material this book. So it's probably likely that Peter himself would have said, Mark, when Jesus died, that veil that temple was rent. It was ripped from top to bottom. And it was probably Peter who said, Mark, this is the gospel. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. So let's see what he had to say. 2 Peter 3, verse 17. He says, You therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, be on your guard so that you are not carried away by the error of undisciplined men and fall from your own steadfastness, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory, both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Jesus, precious Jesus, you are the mediator of this new covenant, and you are the high priest forever. How precious are you, O Lord, to me. May all in this place find you to be precious. And may you be glorified in each and every one of us forever.